Hi, I'm Dr. Nick Leroy. I'm a women's health specialist and patient advocate. In this video, I'm going to talk about my treatment for HPV and cervical dysplasia. HPV is the human papillomavirus, and it's the causative agent in cervical dysplasia, which is a precancerous condition of the uterine cervix, as well as uh, cervical cancer. Everything that I'm going to be talking about in this video can be found on my website, which is uh, drnickleroy.com. Um, I have case studies on there. I have a detailed explanation of cervical dysplasia treatment um, as well as the evidence that supports the treatment that I do for cervical dysplasia and HPV. I've been in practice for over 20 years. I've been treating cervical dysplasia and HPV for over 20 years. I'm also the author of Painting a Target on HPV, which is a detailed evidence-based exploration of everything that we know about HPV as well as cervical dysplasia. Um, in that book, I uh, provide the evidence that supports the treatment that I do. Um, I also have a series of case studies in the book um, to, to be able to show you what the treatment is and what it does. I'm going to also be showing that in this video. So, um, dysplasia, as I said, is a precancerous condition of the uterine cervix, um, and it's caused by the human papillomavirus, which is HPV. Uh, pretty much everybody ends up being exposed to HPV at some point. Um, it's just that not everybody has a problem with it. The way that I would define a problem um, is the uh, development of cervical dysplasia. So you can have an HPV infection that ends up resolving and you never have a uh, cervical dysplasia. And then other women, um, and I talk about this in my book, um, you know, other women have a problem with it and there's genetic reasons, there's mutations that occur, um, such as with folic acid, um, there's a mutation called MTHFR uh, mutation, which, um, causes a problem a, a person not to be able to utilize folic acid properly and, and it ends up causing um, cervical dysplasia so this is an example of a cin3 which is a severe cervical dysplasia so this is in effect um, just one step away from being cervical cancer now this is a close-up of um, the cervix and on it you can see these little sort of um, bumps or these little globules these are called mosaics or mosaic patterns and um, that is a hallmark of cervical dysplasia so when you look at a cervix it should be all pink so none of this should be here the border of this abnormality is right here so this is all um, uh, abnormality this is all cervical dysplasia and it's a severe cervical dysplasia sometimes with severe dysplasia like here you have a, a, a CIN3, which again is a severe cervical dysplasia. This is actually in situ carcinoma. So this has already progressed to where it's a little bit beyond a CIN3, uh, where it's already cancer on the surface. And you can see that there's some irregularity. You start to see some deformation of the surface. Uh, you're seeing it here too. This is a, a CIN3. This is a different case than this one. Again, this is adenocarcinoma um, in situ. So this is another type of cancer that's on the surface but these sort of uh, these little valleys are not supposed to be here so there's are these little um, crevices in the surface that should not be there so that's typically when dysplasia is getting more and more severe you start to see this uh, deformity so my natural therapy consists of two parts there's an indirect part which is diet and supplements and then there's a direct part where you actually put a solution on the cervix itself. The diet's pretty straightforward. Um, and all the research on diet, which there's about 10 or 12 good studies that are all in agreement, which say that when you eat a diet that's high in dark leafy green vegetables like arugula, kale, um, collard greens, cabbage, broccoli, um, some of the yellow orange vegetables like squash, sweet potatoes, carrots, when you eat like that, as well as eat um, fruits, some of the berries, especially like blueberries and cherries, you have about a 60, about a 50 to 60 percent improved chance of clearing HPV, which is appreciable. So that's a significant, uh, a significant difference. The supplements are evidence-based. Again, I talk about I, all of this in my book, as well as how HPV causes cervical dysplasia. 
Um, but the supplements are evidence-based. So there's actually research that shows that there's certain supplements that can help reverse dysplasia and also help uh, eliminate the virus. For example, folic acid deficiency has been known to cause cervical cancer since 1966. So we've known these things a very long time, it's just that they're not part of the standard of care and they're not part of the standard of conventional care in treating cervical dysplasia because they're not FDA approved um, and nobody's going to get FDA approval when you have to pay five to ten billion dollars to bring a drug to market. So you just don't see this becoming part of the standard of care. The direct treatment involves what's called an escharotic solution. An escharotic solution is a solution that's capable of killing abnormal cells, and in doing that, it can form sort of like a scab. So, escher is um, another word for scab. So, uh, it kills the abnormal cells. This solution is comprised of blood root, zinc chloride, and curcumin. Um, it only kills abnormal cells, and I talk about, again, I talk about this in my book, um, but it works via a mechanism where it shuts down something called sodium potassium pumps on the surface of the cells, um, and it only ends up having an effect on, um, on the abnormal cells while leaving the normal cells alone. Also, what we're trying to do with the direct treatment is not only kill the abnormal cells directly, um, it's also causing an inflammatory response, and that inflammatory response on the cervix is what's going to bring in white blood cells and uh, get a more robust immune response. So at the end of the day, we want to kill the abnormal cells, but we also want to get an immune response, because if you get an immune response to whatever strain or strains of HPV that you have, it's going to go away. And there's research that actually has um, demonstrated that fact that if you have a robust immune response, you get rid of HPV. If you get an immune response, it's not going to come back. So here's another case of somebody that I treated. Um, often you see, um, you see um, other um, uh, diseases or other conditions associated with it. Um, in this case, it's cervicitis. So this is a chronic inflammation of the cervix. I know that for a couple of reasons. These are Nebothian cysts. Um, these are a hallmark of inflammation um, or cervicitis. And also we're seeing some little capillaries that are injected or that stand out, which is another um, hallmark of chronic inflammation. So this woman not only had a CIN1, which is a mild dysplasia, but she also had chronic cervicitis. Now, when I treated her at the time uh, um, of the initial um, visit, I put the solution on. I cover everything with that solution when I treat because there could be dysplasia off on the vaginal wall. There could be back along the back of the cervix. It could be within the canal. So I treat everything. I go in the canal. Um, I basically flood the entire area. But as you can see, um, you know, the tissue up here that's pink, the tissue down here that's pink is not affected by the solution, whereas everything else that's abnormal is affected. Now, I continue to treat. Usually I treat about once a week. If I have women that are flying in from um, another state or from another country, um, I vary that. Um, if somebody's local, it's usually about once a week. If it's somebody that's flying in, then usually I'll do once a month and do two treatments back to back. So I may do a Friday, Saturday or a Saturday, Sunday um, and do that once a month. And that works just as well as doing weekly. So this is the same patient um, by treatment six. So after doing five treatments, the area is getting smaller. We're seeing it look uh, kind of an orange yellow because of the curcumin, but now the area is much smaller. It's looking healthier. Those cysts that were up here are gone already. And by treatment nine, they're completely gone. Now pretty much everything's clear except maybe a little bit just around the opening of the canal. So this is the endocervical canal right here. And then after 10 treatments, so this is the time of treatment 11, cervix looks great. Uh, the cervicitis is resolved. We're not seeing any Nebothian cysts. After I put the solution on, we're not seeing anything staining. Um, one of the things about the solution is it, it kills the abnormal cells, but it also stains them. So we can monitor progress that we just witnessed. So uh, treatment by treatment, what we're looking for is the area to get smaller, smaller, smaller. And when everything looks great, like at this point, then we're done with treatment and we do a, a pap. And in, in her case, you know, this is treatment one. This is how it looked. This is after 10 treatments. Um, looks great. Her pap was normal and she was um, HPV negative. And here's another case, 32-year-old. Uh, this is a severe cervical dysplasia. 
and what's significant about this case is she also had a, a severe cervical dysplasia in the canal. Now, your conventional doctor is likely to want to do more aggressive therapies when it's known to be in the canal like this. Um, they'll usually do either a more aggressive leap where they carve out tissue um, or a conization where they use a scalpel and they just carve out a big wedge. Um, in any event, it's uh, often used to justify more aggressive treatment and you don't need to do that. And in fact, it's a bad idea um, because it's just not very good at getting rid of the virus. Um, as you'll see uh, in the next few slides, I go through the stats on HPV clearance with leaps, conization, as well as with my treatment. So this is um, after we completed the treatment. Cervix looks great. Um, we're not seeing any of the, the staining that we were seeing before and her pap was normal and HPV negative. Here's a patient who had some scarring from a prior leap. So about three years prior to this, she had a leap and um, the electro excisional loop, um, which is an electrocautery instrument that carved out this chunk of tissue. It left some scar tissue here. Now she had a recurrent um, dysplasia when she came in. So this was a, um, a CIN2 uh, that I treated uh, 11 times. And this is how it looked after the 11th treatment. What's really interesting about using a solution you, like this, which is an escharotic solution, is it sort of acts like a chemical peel. So in effect, it, it, um, if there's any scarring, if there's any deformation of the cervix, it acts like a chemical peel and it ends up helping resurface the cervix. So this is like a, like a brand new cervix. Um, it's really quite dramatic. So her pap is normal and HPV negative. So my success rates. Um, I will be publishing a two-year retrospective sampling of high-grade lesions. High-grade lesions are um, CIN2 and CIN3, so moderate and severe, uh, severely dysplastic lesions are termed uh, high-grade. Um, in that two-year um, sampling period, there were 67 cases that I treated of SIN2 and SIN3. I had a 98.5% elimination of all dysplasia. In fact, 100% of SIN3 resolved. Um, I had one case of SIN2 that went from SIN2 to SIN1, so it got better. And in her case, she had a different a low risk virus, which was causing some warts, which can um, cause mild dysplasia as well. So she had an improvement. So overall, I had a 98.5% improvement, a 91% uh, clearance of HPV. When you contrast that to LEAPS, you get about 65% clearance of HPV with a LEAP procedure and about 72% clearance of HPV when you do cold knife conization, which is actually using a scalpel um, to uh, remove a very, a fairly large um, area of the cervix. As you can see, um, the treatment that I do for cervical dysplasia in HPV is highly effective. Um, most women uh, take about 8 to 12 treatments. Surprisingly, it really, um, it doesn't really matter on the severity. I've seen cases of, of mild dysplasia that were as difficult as um, severely dysplastic cases.